Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Chère Madame Zemkova, Monsieur le conseiller administratif, chère Samy, Madame la directrice exécutive, chère Corinne, que je ne vois pas, qui est là. Uh, dear members of the Geneva Graduate Institute Foundation Board, Your Excellencies, dear students, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome this evening to the second edition of the Kofi Annan Geneva Peace Address here at the Geneva Graduate Institute within the very well named, particularly for tonight, Maison de la Paix. The Kofi Annan Geneva Peace Address is a high-level lecture on peace that is held every year as part of the Geneva Peace Week, the latter having now become a tradition on the international Geneva scene. Let me express here my warm thank you to our partners for this yearly event, the Kofi Annan Foundation and the Geneva Peace Building Platform. Let me just say here and reiterate, uh, dear Corinne, dear Hanissa, how proud and happy we are at the Institute to be collaborating with you and with all the teams on this very important event. Let me also express our thanks to the Republic and the State of Geneva, to the City of Geneva and the Fondation pour Genève for their strong support. Dear Samy, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I would also like to acknowledge with very great pleasure the important role this year of our friends and neighbors from the Right Livelihood. Um, they made the visit of our speaker tonight possible. Indeed, Ms. Elena Zemkova, for those of you who don't know, received the Right Livelihood Award in, 20, uh, in 2004, confirming, dear Ole, the nickname of the Right Livelihood Award as being the Alternative Noble. More generally, I have to say, dear Ole, that I'm delighted about our growing collaboration and the diverse path that it might take it must be my Swedish spiritual blood. <laughs> Last but not least, I would also like to express my thank you to the team at the Graduate Institute, to Akim Venman, to Lena Menge, but also to my entire Comms and Evans team. Um, what a pleasure and a chance it is for me to be working with all of you on a daily basis. It really is an honor and a privilege to welcome you this evening at the Maison de la Paix, Ms. Zenkova. Ms. Zenkova is the co-founder and the executive director of Memorial, and as you all know, her organization, Memorial, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize this year, in 2022, together with the human rights advocate, Alice Bialatsky from Belarus, and the Ukrainian human rights organization, Center for Civil Liberties. The Norwegian Nobel Committee decided to honor this year three outstanding champions of human rights, democracy, and peaceful coexistence, who do so, furthermore, across and beyond the borders of war. To quote the UN Secretary General, this year's Nobel Peace Prize represents the oxygen of democracy and puts the spotlight on the power of civil society to advance peace. Corinne will tell us more about Memorial and its role, but let me underscore here three reasons why it makes particular sense for us, Ms. Zemkova, to welcome you and through you to honor your organization at the Geneva Graduate Institute. First, the first reason is that peace is at the heart of our identity. At the Institute, we were born in 1927 for peace, with peace as our structuring compass. The role of peace in our self-definition remains central, and we affirm today that in the context of current global challenges, peace is and will be unthinkable and impossible without the additional pillars of sustainability and equity. The Geneva Peace Week taking place within our walls this week shows how a university like ours can curate exchanges among diverse actors from Geneva and beyond around the promotion of peace across contexts and disciplines. The theme of this year, is of, of the, the Geneva um, Peace, uh, Peace Week, is Peace is Possible. And the fight your organization is associated with, Ms. Zemkova, is a concrete materialization of this claim indeed. Peace is possible even when it is threatened, we must and we should keep affirming that peace is possible. A second reason why it makes sense for us to welcome you has to do with the bridge that you and your organization are creating between the past, history, and memory on the one hand, and the defense of a certain vision of humanity here and now today. Democracy is impossible without memory. 
while totalitarianism, on the other hand, thrives on the mutilation and the destruction of history and of memory. At the Institute, we strongly believe that we cannot build a meaningful future without deeply embracing and understanding our history, without sustaining our memory. A third reason, last but not least, is that in this age of renewed fears, some of which are definitely existential fears, we have to declare an age of courage. Courage will be the theme, as it happens, of our year at the Institute, and your organization and yourself, Ms. Zemkova, embody, if anything else, courage. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, welcome again, and let me now give the floor to Monsieur Sami Kanan. Thank you very much, Marie-Laure, for hosting us again for a very crucial event. I'm very happy how involved the Graduate Institute is in this type of events and projects. It's very crucial for our city. And it's really, we are grateful for your involvement and the whole team of the Graduate Institute. Zemkova, we are very proud to host you here in Geneva just before you get the actual Nobel Prize, so we can still meet you, because afterwards you will be so demanded all over the planet. So we are happy to have you before the ceremony. And it's a very impressive coincidence that earlier this year, in February, we could host the previous Nobel Prizes, 21, Maria Ressa and Dimitri Muratov, also in Geneva, to talk about freedom of press, freedom of expression, and uh, again, we are happy as a city of Geneva to be part of this event. And thank you to the Foundation Kofi Annan, to Right Livelihood, and all the partners to make this possible. The authorities of the city of Geneva try in a very modest way to contribute to all efforts towards peace. It seems obvious that every human being wants peace, in theory. But I know, we know how difficult it is to build peace and for, especially to maintain it. Peace is not just the absence of war. It's not just the absence of conflict or violence. Peace is a much more ambitious and complex project. It implies a lot of efforts. If you want it sustainable, to bring back peace and conflict is one thing, but to maintain peace afterwards, to heal all the the violence, the bad memories, the blood which has been shed over the conflict to imply forgiveness, openness, tolerance, understanding, mutual understanding, and to build a common ground that allows peace to be really sustainable. We all know how difficult it is. It requires a lot of effort, and it requires personalities who can structure this work and structure this process and bring positive impulse even in situations which, which seem desperate. If you look at history, and I think if I had to study again now to start new studies, I may study history. Because more than ever, if you look at the present conflicts in Europe and elsewhere, the understanding of history is crucial. And I guess that all the students in this room will agree, and all the academics. Because many researchers, well-known researchers, state nowadays that actually humankind has been progressing towards peace. That there is less violence and war than like 200 or 500 or 1,000 years ago. I'm not talking about the climate issue because that's getting much worse at the moment. In terms of peace process, for example, the famous psychologist Steven Pinker had a publication of more than 1,000 pages called The Better Angels of Our Nature. He's demonstrating that violence is going back in humankind. Even the very critical economist and very famous Thomas Piketty, who published A Brief History of Equality, pretends to have proven that since the 18th century, there is more equality and inequality is regressing. It seems strange because you have the impression that it is the contrary. So we have to take into account this research to put it in the discussion and to put it in perspective with the present perception we have and the fact that nowadays we have the impression that conflict is all over the planet. 
It may be related to the fact that we have much more information than 50 years ago. We have far too far information. We are informed in life on all conflicts in a way that human being is not always prepared to. But still, to have some background information, to take some distance, to try to avoid being only discussing based on immediate emotion and reactions, that is absolutely crucial. I know that the World Peace Index, established every year by the Institute for Economics and Peace, shows that the, this peace index is getting bad since 40 years, worse. It's an alarm. It shows that even if it's progressing over the hundreds of years, it's regressing in the last years. It's a real alarm, and especially the relation between peace and democracy. So we need personalities, we need people who engage themselves. Some of them are famous. Many of them are unknown. Many of them try in their daily life, in a very modest way, discreet way, to promote peace and to avoid violence. And I really welcome the whole Peace Week, and especially the fact that you introduced this notion of Geneva Peace Address, and the first two guests are women. It's a symbol as such. And I hope that this is also a message for the future. The fact that we have now war in Europe, I mean, I'm half from Europe, half from Lebanon, so I know what war is. I was growing up in a war country. For some Europeans, they had forgotten that war can be so close. And I'm not happy about that. It's not a cynical statement. It shows that it's not only far away in Africa, in Middle East, or elsewhere. It can be also in the same continent we are living, very close to us, and very threatening. I hope that at least this impression contributes to the conviction that peace is never like acquired forever. It requires permanent effort, permanent investment, because the suffering, the, the waste of human beings, of resources, of uh, also cultural inheritance is so enormous, so difficult to match up, to, to get back after the, the war, that we really have, it's not only a wish, it's an obligation that we work all together on that. So Geneva has really the role and the tradition of hosting any people, any entity, any organization who is willing to discuss, to have dialogue, even in very difficult conditions. And this is part of our responsibility as public authorities. So we're very proud again, Ms. Jemkova, to have you tonight and to congratulate you for your Nobel Prize, which will be soon given physically in Stockholm. And I thank you again, all the partners. And I would like to congratulate you because you work on historical issues, how to cope with the history of a country. Just in Geneva, and I was presenting it here in March, we did, a, we did a study with the Graduate Institute, Professor from the Graduate Institute, about big names which we have on our streets and public space to show that history is not always as fantastic and glorious. And even a democratic country like Switzerland should look at its history and admit that not everything has been perfectly right and respectful for other populations. So it's all the more an example for us that you do it in such a difficult context. I wish you a very interesting evening, and thank you again. Mrs. Zemkova, Monsieur le Conseil administratif de la Ville de Genève, Madame la Directrice de l'Institut Chamarilor, Mesdames et Messieurs, les représentants permanents, chers étudiants, chers amis, thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Kofi Annan Foundation for being here tonight for the Kofi Annan Geneva Peace Address. As has already been said, this is a, a project, a joint project of the Kofi Annan Foundation, the Graduate Institute, and the Geneva Peace Building Platform. And the inaugural Peace Address was delivered in this auditorium exactly uh, a year ago by another uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Peace, uh, said Kofi Annan, when he himself received the Nobel Peace Prize, must be sought above all because it is the condition for every member of the human family to live a life of dignity and security. With war raging in the heart of Europe, in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel, and so many other places, it is more important than ever to talk about peace and offer a platform to those who build it day after day. And what better place to do it than here in Geneva, 
the capital of peace, and what better time to do it than during the Geneva Peace Week when dozens of practitioners assemble here to really look at the daily grind of building peace. Je tiens donc à remercier particulièrement euh, le canton et la ville de Genève et la fondation de Genève pour leur soutien. Et par leur engagement, ces institutions démontrent une fois de plus que l'esprit de Genève est bien vivant. Et un huge thank you as well to the Right Livelihood Award, RLA, who made this event possible today. As Marie-Laure has said, of course, the Human Rights Organization Memorial was given this year, 2022, or is about to be given the Nobel Peace Prize, together with human rights advocate Alice Baliaski from Belarus and the Ukrainian Human Rights Organization, the Center for Civil Liberties. Founded in 1987 by Andrei Sakharov, yet another Nobel Peace Laureate, Memorial has spent 30 years working across Russia, as well as in several other European countries to, co to compile a history of mass atrocities and political repression in the former USSR and to defend human rights wherever they are threatened. And Mrs. Zemkova is a mathematician by education. She was a co-founder of Memorial Society. Since 1988, she has been working as member of its board and since 1995 as executive director of Memorial Historical, Educational, and Human Rights Society. Her main academic interests include the history of political repression and a comparative analysis of the Nazi and Soviet repression mechanisms. In June 2022, Elena Zemkova received the title of Dr. Honoris Causa from Sciences Po in Paris, my alma mater. When announcing the uh, laureates for 2022, the Nobel Committee noted, and I quote, Memorial is based on the notion that confronting past crimes is essential in preventing new ones. And when you received the Right Livelihood Award on behalf of Memorial already back in, 20, in 2004, so RLA has quite a few years, is quite a few years ahead of the Nobel uh, Committee, you said, Mrs. Zem Zemkova, and I quote again, the spirit of our work is the fight for truth and law. Kofi Annan also often spoke of the need to document crimes and end impunity to break the vicious cycle of violence that feed conflict. And he recognized that the parallel pursuit of justice and peace is difficult, presents challenges, but he always stressed that we have to be bold enough, ambitious enough to pursue both. And the Nobel Committee noted also in its 22 uh, communique that when civil society must give way to autocracy and dictatorship, peace is often the next victim. The retreat of democracy on all continents over the last 15 years has indeed coincided with the return of war and an increase in the number of battle-related deaths. Recent events show clearly the dangers involved in the rise of autocrats who elevate nationalism and at the expense of peace and understanding. So speaking in this auditorium just a few months ago, Maria Ressa, the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize recipient, told us that without truth, there is no trust, and that without trust, there is no democracy. And I'd like to paraphrase her tonight and to say that without truth, there is no reconciliation and no justice, and that without reconciliation and justice, there is no peace. So the search for truth must be a priority of peace builders. So Mrs. Zemkova, a huge thank you for accepting to come here tonight and deliver the second uh, Geneva Kofi Annan Peace Address. Just before I give you the floor, just a note to uh, all our audience that Mrs. Zemkova will speak in Russian. You do have headphones. Please put them on now. And uh, I believe that uh, Russian will be on channel one and English on channel two. So thank you again for being here with us. And may I now invite you, Mrs. Zhenkova, to the podium to deliver the 2022 Kofi Annan Geneva Peace Address. Thank you.
According to the latest figures by the United Nations Human Rights High Commissioner, which is still incomplete, from the 24th of February 2022, when the Russian Federation launched its armed attack on Ukraine, and until the 30th of October, over 6,430 Ukrainian civilians were killed. And I would like to begin my statement with a moment of silence to honor the memory of all those victims of the ongoing war. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I thank you for this honor of addressing you. I am delighted to be here today. I'd like to thank Professor Marie Lorsel, Director of the Graduate Institute of Geneva, for inviting me to this renowned institute. My thanks also go to Karim Mamal Vanyan and the Kofi Annan Foundation for keeping the memory of Kofi Annan alive. Kofi Annan was also a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and his legacy of peacemaking is still relevant today. The power of his personality continues to inspire us. I'd also like to thank Ola von Vexkul and the Right Livelihood Foundation for supporting the work of the Memorial Society. Since the Memorial received the Right Livelihood Award back in 2004. I also thank the Geneva Peace Building Platform for hosting this Geneva Peace Week. I'd like to thank Mr. Sami Kanan and the City of Geneva. I take this invitation to speak here as an expression of interest, support and solidarity with the cause that Memorial and the many thousands of people who cooperate with us serve. On the 7th of October, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the Memorial Society. I found out about it in Tbilisi, in a taxi cab, on my way to the opening of an exhibition called Daddy's Letters. This exhibition tells the story of the people who died in Stalin's camps, how they managed to send letters to the outside, to their children who knew nothing of the fate and suffering. On that same day, in the very heart of Russia, in the Komi Republic, my colleagues opened the exhibition called The Right to Correspondence. It is another exhibition about the fate of Soviet prisoners, but mainly about the fact that human connections are preserved, even in the most brutal conditions, despite all efforts by the state. I was very worried about my colleagues in Russia. I was afraid that during the opening of the exhibition in the Kobe Republic there would be another aggressive hoodlum attack. All the local authorities would ban the exhibition under some bogus pretext. These new exhibitions of the memorial are the result of several years of hard work by memorial historians and archivists as part of a major international project supported by Switzerland. And I take this opportunity to thank the people of Switzerland for understanding the importance and the necessity of our work that deals with the Soviet past and our fight for human rights today. Today, the memorial is going through a difficult time. The International Memorial, which was the coordination center for a network of memorial organizations in various countries, more than 40 organizations in six countries, was liquidated by an absurd and unlawful ruling passed by the Russian Supreme Court. 
на покупку этого to дома мы собирали пожертвования Мир понял и поддержал нас. Мы собрали 3 миллиона долларов. Мы купили помещение по коммерческой цене, оплатили все налоги. Мы оборудовали украсть дом. Это был теплый родной дом. Я говорю все три буквы. Теплый родной дом. Это был дом правды о прошлом. The house of truth by the past, the house of human rights, an important point on Moscow's map, on Russia's map, and I'm sure on the map of the world. For many years, this place was home to research work, exhibitions, conferences, workshops, and schools for young scientists. It was home to a unique and open archive, a museum and a library. This Russian court ruled, contrary to applicable laws, that if an organization is liquidated, all of its legally acquired property now belongs to the state. Some day it has been in the life of the memorial, the 7th of October, 2022. Two exhibitions in two different countries, one Nobel Prize and one house repossessed. Why is there such a great contrast between the hostile attitude of the Russian authorities towards the work of the memorial and the recognition of the memorial's merits around the world? Why are the Russian authorities so aggressive? Why are they so cool towards ordinary people who are engaged in history and defend the dignity and human rights of ordinary citizens? And it is not only cruel and aggressive towards us from the memorial. Why have the Russian authorities been systematically and consistently restricting civil society for the past 20 years through legal persecution, administrative coercion, and more recently by resorting to overt Почему агрессивные жестокие люди, которые делают свою работу для пользы обычных людей, опасно и безопасно, опираясь только на убеждения силы и права? The power of truth. I think it is because the Russian authorities have once again placed themselves above the society that the idea of the state rather than human rights has become paramount. This flawed hierarchy of values inevitably leads to the suppression of civil liberties and repression of dissenters. On the 7th of October, here in Geneva, again the 7th of October, so on the 7th of October, another historic event took place here in Geneva, the city of peace. On the 7th of October 2022, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution appointing a special rapporteur on human rights violations in Russia. The memorial considers it extremely important that for the first time in the history of the UN, a special rapporteur on human rights has been appointed to report all violations by one of the five permanent members of the Security Council. The unprecedented nature of this development reflects the grave concern of the international community about the serious nature of the human rights violations taking place. 
There are historians, said the memorial, who could cite plenty of examples, showing that the war thrives on lies. War disenfranchises the, the individual. War suppresses the individual. Recent events, once again, demonstrated that violence and injustice towards one's own people and society and the desire of some top state officials to maintain their power at all costs invariably translates into external aggression as well. For me, the link between repression inside and violence outside is obvious. And today, with the ongoing war, this cause and effect relation needs to be explained and emphasized, and this is what I'd like to talk about. During the 35 years of Memorial's existence, the organization has come a long way, from a few community groups promoting the idea of creating a memorial complex in Moscow to commemorate the victims of Stalin's terror. Hands our name. We call ourselves the memorial because of this memorial complex. To a collaboration of dozens of historical, educational and human rights organizations operating in many cities across Russia and Ukraine as well as in Germany, Italy, the Czech Republic and France. Already at the very outset of this journey, we realized three important things. First, that the granite and marble memorial complex can wait. The main objective was to collect and preserve the popular memory of the victims of terror and the machinery of terror. The memory which not so long ago was semi-forbidden, banished from the public sphere. Secondly, that no one but ourselves can accomplish this task. The state is not worth relying on. And thirdly, that human rights violations, the suppression of dissent, and the habit of state diktat will not disappear overnight. Problems remain and require constant attention. So, the very first thing the memorial set out to do, and what we're still doing today, is explore the history of the Soviet totalitarian regime and its current consequences for Russia, Europe and the world. Our job is very simple. It is to tell people in detail what this evil looks like in practice and what it leads to. Not long thereafter, almost immediately, the memorial delved into another important area of work, the human rights. At the turn of the 1990s, and I'm sure you know, many conflicts erupted in the former USSR, most of them ethnic in nature. Some of these conflicts, to our horror, escalated into full-blown wars. It was difficult to explore the history of human rights abuses in the past when the same kind of crimes continued to be committed all around us. We therefore focused our efforts on the so-called hotspots or conflicts in the post-Soviet space. Karabakh, Abkhazia, Transnistria, South Ossetia, Tajikistan, and later Chechnya. This was all areas of our work, and of course we got involved with the refugees and IDPs who were running from these conflicts. It is important to outline the world view that has united the people of the memorial from the very outset on which we have relied for our historical and cultural, educational, human rights and civic activities. We do not look at terror from an ideological standpoint, but rather on the basis of a certain system of values we have developed. This system is traditionally humanistic, it is based on the priority of human life, the preservation of human dignity and freedom over everything else, including the interests of the state, parties and classes. We see the source of evil, its core, in attempts to put any abstract categories, an idea, a religion, a nation, a state, anything at all, above a human being. This is why the individual human fate has always been and remains the key unit of historical knowledge, the bodies of historical memory that memorial collects and works with.
Еще важно, что мы рассматриваем советский тоталитаризм не как локальный исторический фенотип. Это режим, как режим, одно из обычных международных общечеловеческого зла. К сожалению, сегодня у нас есть страшное подтверждение тому, что зло, с мы собрались здесь в рамках Женевской Геневи мира. Мы здесь для того, чтобы говорить о мире. Но мир — это гораздо больше, чем отсутствие войны. Исходя из этого, я хочу поделиться с вами тремя ключевыми моментами, которые мы усвоили за 35 лет работы мемориал. Первое. Для мира нужна правда. Мемориал возник как широкое общественное движение людей за правду о прошлом. Мемориал — это стремление множества людей знать правду и рассказать правду. По минимальным оценкам, только при лучшей террора и репрессии в Советском Союзе было не менее 11 миллионов. Прибавьте к этому членов семей, ближайших родственников. Прибавьте миллионы жертв искусственного, возникшего по вине государства. Famine caused by the state. We are talking about tens of millions of people. The necessary and obligatory, from our point of view, cure for the trauma that so many people endured. For the entire nation, essentially, it is the truth. Если мы хотим, чтобы ужас не повторился, а мы хотим, нам нужна вся правда, вся, не прикрашенная и не адаптированная, вся правда о прошлом. Мы должны знать, что, когда и как происходило. Нам нужны детали и подробности. Нам нужны имена и судьбы. Я считаю уместным процитировать заявление мемориала, которое мы сделали в 1989 году. Это 33 года назад. Прошлое не принадлежит никому в отдельности. Оно достояние нынешнего и грядущего поколения. Только оставаясь таким, защищенным от монополизма, оно способно быть действенной силой в предотвращении новых ошибок и преступлений. New outbreaks of violence and calls for fratricide. If we do not know the truth, if we allow such recent crimes to be forgotten, let alone justified, we will once again be subordinating history to today's politics, once again opening the door to state-sponsored violence. Therefore, Our conclusion is that in order to preserve peace, we need the truth, documented, publicly available, which becomes the basis of public work and social harmony. Second, peace needs democracy and human rights. When the interests of a state become the main value, democracy disappears. In the interests of the state, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly are restricted. Free elections are gradually eroded, and when the power becomes effectively removable, any crimes committed in the name of the state and in the interest of the state go unpunished. Impunity for human rights violations, crimes against humanity in local wars and conflicts within a country, inevitably spills over. In countries where democracy works, where the government is controlled by the society, where human rights are immutably respected, where there is an independent judiciary, where victims of crimes demand and receive justice, where criminals know that punishment is inevitable, people stand a better chance of keeping their governments out of war. Therefore, our conclusion is that if we want to have a chance for peace, we need human rights. To be observed, we need a functioning democracy. And third, peace needs all of us. Yes, the citizens of Russia have failed to keep the country out of war. Why? Мы смогли много сделать для восстановления памяти о прошлом и справедливости в отношении и советского террора. И современного государства производства. Мы многое сделали для того, чтобы преступники были названы. Но мы не смогли добиться, чтобы преступлением была одна ясная правовая цель. 
Компенсация жертвам – это важно, но недостаточно. Чтобы преступление не повторилось, оно, по крайней мере, должно быть названо преступлением и осуждено. В России на законодательном уровне фактически не были осуждены преступления прошлого. Закон о реабилитации жертв политических репрессий, подготовленный мемориалом и проведенный через законодательный орган в 1991 году, осуждает террор самым Но этого слишком мало. Люди в России знают о жертвах и даже сочувствуют, но не понимают, что это жертвы преступления и бесконтрольной воли государства. Большинство российских граждан не смогло понять, что государство, которое функционирует на налоги граждан и создано для организации свободной и защищенной жизни, без контроля и надзора со стороны гражданского общества способна превратить в Формула справедливости для жертв и наказания преступников теряет смысл если выполняется только одно из этих условий. Конечно, отвечать за разрастающийся сегодня на наших глазах кошмар военных преступлений и сжений, разбираться с последствиями этой катастрофы, предстоит многим поколениям моих сограждан. Тем важнее и весомее для меня каждый голос протеста против войны, который звучит сегодня в И поэтому наш вывод для сохранения мира нужны мы все, нужны усилия каждого из нас. Важный для меня вопрос, чего ждет is, от нас всех вместе мир, и us, что мы можем сделать для мира together, сегодня, сейчас, в эту минуту. Now, Уверен, moment, мир ждет sure от нас продолжения нашей работы, нашей обычной, черной, рутинной, routine, иногда ужасно скучной работы. Мы должны work. знать, вы должны знать, гражданское общество в России не задавлено, не умерло, crushed, оно не сдается. It's not За антивоенные выступления, at least, у меня самые свежие, самые последние данные. За антивоенные so, выступления было задержано не менее 19 347 человек. жестокого подавления и насилия – это немало. Правда на нашей стороне. Мы воспринимаем Нобелевскую премию как премию всему российскому гражданскому обществу. И мы гордимся тем, что получили ее вместе с коллегами и друзьями из Беларуси и Украины. Норвежский Нобелевский комитет своим решением подчеркнул, что гражданское общество важнее, чем государственный интерес, и что гражданские общества разных стран могут быть едины в стремлении к общечеловеческим ценностям. Многие люди мемориала остаются работать в России. Многие были вынуждены уехать. Это всегда трудное решение для человека. Но мы видим в этом возможности нового объединения с миром. Сейчас мемориал находится в стадии переформирования своей структуры, пополнения ее новыми организациями в разных странах. И для этого нам, конечно, понадобится поддержка, особенно здесь, в Швейцарии, и здесь, из Женевы, города Мира. Главной опорой для нас остается сила права, сила права и сила демократии. Мы выступаем за мир, подобный тому, о котором мечтал Кофи Мир, построенный на взаимопонимании, вовлечении гражданского общества в национальные и международные процессы. Мир, в котором повсеместно укрепляется права человека и демократия, и обеспечивается всеобщее правосудие для жизни. Я надеюсь, что большинство активных людей из стран бывшего Советского Союза поддерживают нас в этом. Пусть девиз мемориал «Правда и справедливость для всех состраданий и жертв, наказания и преступников» будет основой нашего сотрудничества. Нобелевскую премию, большой международный интерес в нашей работе вдохновляют нас, людей мемориала, продолжать свою усилие по сохранению истинной правды, укрепления принципов справедливости и Я благодарю вас
Thank you very much, Lena. My name is Ole von Uxkel, Executive Director at Right Livelihood. We have been honoring courageous people providing concrete and practical solutions to urgent global problems since 1980. People who at the same time work for large-scale system alternatives and who show with their practical work that another world is possible. We're a Swedish foundation, but we have been part of the Maison de la Paix since its inception here in 2015, and we're very proud to be amongst you in this community. And as has been mentioned before, in 2004, we had the honor to award Memorial International with the Right Livelihood Award. We're so happy that you are a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize this year, and we are so honored here that you give your first international speech in Geneva. Thank you, Lena. I hope, I hope the Nobel Peace Prize Committee is not going to strip us of the prize because we first came to Geneva and then we'll go to Oslo. I don't know what they say about that in Oslo. Um, and significantly, as also has been mentioned, you receive the Nobel Peace Prize together with two other Right Livelihood laureates, actually, Alex Bialyatsky from Belarus and Alexandra Matvichuk and the Center for Civil Liberties from Ukraine. And at Right Livelihood, when you receive our award, that is actually not the end of the relationship, it's the beginning of our relationship with the laureates. So over the past 18 years, we have met so many times together in international fora. I have been in Moscow many times. We've been there with international delegations. And every time the repression that you face becomes more absurd, and every time the situation has been more difficult when I met you, and every time your resolve has been stronger, every time there has been a greater spirit at Memorial, every time there have been more young people working at your offices who will carry that spirit forward. And even now that they have what they call liquidated you as an organization, even now that you are threatened with losing your office, your spirit is unbroken and your positive energy is very much alive as we're witnessing here tonight. So what, what keeps you and your colleagues going again and again um, in the face of all these difficulties and, and repression? The people. And what is more, first and foremost, these are the people whose Fate concerns. And when you look at the trials and tribulations they had to go through and managed to remain dignified, good people, they preserved their friendships, the love for their family. In the face of want, they continued to help others. This is, no doubt, a basis for optimism. And these people, my friends, the people of the memorial who sometimes have extremely difficult lives and they continue to work. And the people all around the world, especially now when we're faced with such difficulties, when they show their solidarity to such an extent, well, my answer would be the people. And, and that is really the spirit um, that one feels every time visiting the memorial offices. And, um, and as you already mentioned in your speech, the Nobel Peace Prize was given jointly to Memorial, to Alice Bialyatsky from Belarus, to the Center for Civil Liberties from Ukraine, because of, as the Nobel Committee put it, the importance of civil society to build peace and democracy. So maybe you could say something more about the, the cooperation and the common agenda among civil society actors in these three countries and in the post-Soviet space. 
Ну, надо сказать, что well, темы, которыми занимается мемориал, это те же темы, topics, the the topics, Belarus, Ukraine, и это потому, что и нарушение прав человека не имеет границ. Мы с вами не no, можем no сидеть и равнодушно смотреть на то, что происходит в чужой стране. And do nothing about Но something that is happening in another country границ. next door. But our и memory does not know any borders either. Истории, and now that they instrumentalize history and the consequences thereof show that we can't idly как... sit and watch то, what is going on. So our entire cooperation is very specific in nature. We maintain lists of political prisoners. We take care of the refugees and IDPs. And at the same time, we work with our collective memory. And by the way, This project that I referred to in my presentation and for which I thank you and which received a lot of support from Switzerland, this international project boils down to the fact that all of us together, human rights activists, historians from Russia, Belarus and Georgia, that all of us together, we will continue to work on our collective memory and These exhibitions are a form, a way to work with our collective memory, and it's an amazing story. The first exhibition that we showed, we showed in 2019 in Belarus, and we didn't have a local partner. We were looking for a spot where we could do it, and we won a tender to... Um, Brent, a gallery, and do you know who uh, the director of this gallery was? It was Maria Kolesnikova. And late, literally, several months later, she was arrested. And at the time, this was a fantastic exhibition. We had great plans. And I think it's important to also note in that context that Alice Bialyatsky and other colleagues of Vyasna are in prison in Belarus as we speak here, and we at Right Live together with another, an international coalition are calling for their immediate release. You've been very vocal, Lena and Memorial, in general criticizing the Russian aggression in Ukraine since 2014. Actually, the latest wave of repression against Memorial, which now led to what they call the liquidation of the organization, started when a group of hooligans, of uh, thugs, stormed your office on the evening that you were showing a film about the Gala d'Amor, the um, Soviet-induced hunger that killed millions of Ukrainians in the early 30s. And Following this, the same night, the police sealed off your offices and um, seized the so-called evidence, which then led to the liquidation. In your speech, you talked about the connection between repression inside Russia and violence in Russian foreign policy. Would you go as far as to say that the repression that we've been witnessing against civil society in Russia has been a deliberate preparation for the war against Ukraine? Well, if we look at what is going on and what came to pass after that, then yes. Clearly, in a situation such as today, the government needs to have a completely controlled society that does not have any alternative points of view. So, and from that perspective, they want to destroy, they want to shut down anybody who has an independent position. Not only speaking against, but you know what they said in the Soviet times. Who are you being silent against? So even those people who are being silent against the government, even those need to be shut down. Not only those who speak against or are silent against something, but 
Everybody needs to speak in favor of the government, and from that perspective, it is indeed important to make sure that there is nobody who speaks against. Lena, you said something beautiful in your speech when you said that the memorial made of granite and marble can wait. Your priority is to work directly with people for historical remembrance. And one wonderful expression of this is the Vasvrashenie Imion, the return of names, where every year, actually just days ago, on the 29th of October, people come out and read the names of victims of the Bolshoi Terror, of, the, of Stalin's great purges of the late 30s. Can you talk about this people-centered approach to historical memory and why that is seen as such a threat by the Putin administration? Well, this was our very objective from the very outset. You see, it's easy, it may perhaps not so easy, but it's relatively easy to speak beautiful words. But how can you walk um, this way? How can you turn from the words to actual action. Another important question is we're talking about millions of victims. When we talk about millions of victims, it becomes a mere number. The human brain is incapable of processing millions of kills, millions of victims. They may feel compassion with one or two people, especially if they are somebody you know. They can probably fathom what it is when we're talking about a hundred people killed, well, they can imagine this hall, this auditorium, and they can imagine that that many people died. But 11 million people cannot be even imagined. It's unfathomable. So that has always been the main question for us. How can we keep and preserve the human dimension? How can we keep the faces of those victims? And from that perspective, that marble and granite memorial could wait, although it is important to have those memorials. And every single time we need to find a way for these memorials to be raised because the human beings are the most important thing. But the government doesn't like it when we say that the human being is more important. That means that everything else has to be done for the human being. And that applies also to the state. So we have to adopt this very sober and rational approach. If it works well, well done. If it doesn't work, well, let's improve it. If we adopt this approach, then perhaps everything will be measured in different proportions. And naturally, the government doesn't like it. We could uh, listen to you the whole evening. And despite that, we are already... By the way, I am not the best talking head from the memorial. There are many people who are much better than me, so you should call others to come and they will deliver even a better presentation and answer your questions much better than me. At the end of the day, I'm just the executive director. My responsibility is to make sure that this machine works. I'm a bit like the government. If I work well, I get the praise. If not, I don't. You are too humble. Um, but we still have time for a few questions from the audience. And I would actually propose that we do three questions. We collect three questions in a row, and then Lena will answer them. And we have a first hand up in the back of the room. You have microphones coming. Hello. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So as a self-respecting Armenian, I have to say, that the next time you receive a big award, I really hope that you are in Yerevan and not Tbilisi. And um, my question relates, of course, to one of the deadliest conflicts that you mentioned, and that's the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The current situation is that the peace talks are expected, and a peace agreement is potentially expected in the next few months, hopefully. 
But one of the things often mentioned in humanitarian affairs literature is that truth can endanger the peace process. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is this tension between the truth and the peace? And what is the best way of navigating? Because no sustainable peace is possible without the truth. But how we can achieve peace and truth together? Thank you so much. Thank you. And we can have two more questions for this round. There's another one in the back. Hello, my question will be in Russian. My name is Diana, I come from Kazakhstan. It is a great honor for me to be able to ask you this question, which is as follows. You have talked a lot about the past, something you deal with on a regular basis. You talked about the Soviet past, and I come from the region, from the Central Asia. I'd like to ask you the following question. To what extent in Russia today, for you and for the memorial, and the space has shrunk. To what, ex to what extent you see an opportunity to expand your activities in Central Asia? Uh, because we are a part of this past, as you said. And to what extent the Western outlook on the Second World War, well, for instance, in Germany, to what extent are you adopting their methods, their tools to improve your work? Thank you very much. And one here, the gentleman in the dark uh, sweater. Good evening, Elena. My name is Stanislav. I come from Belarus. And I work with the Belarus Helsinki Committee. And my question is as follows. Yes, you mentioned today that Oles Bilatsky and several thousand people and human rights activists in Belarus are constantly persecuted and work under a lot of pressure. What would you say today to the Belarusian government? What would you say to this entire machinery, which at the moment is simply oppressing the entire region? Thank you very much. You know, all of these questions were very pertinent, and I'll try to answer all of them, but all of them are very serious questions. If we are serious about it. But I'll try to be brief and I'll start with the last question. What would I say to the Belarusian authorities? The same that I would say to the Russian government. Observe human rights. Observe your own laws. And I would remind them, you know, I always remember this law on the rehabilitation of the victims of political repression, dated 1991. Do you know who was the first to vote this law in at this time at the Supreme Council of the Soviet Union? It was the, the communists. At the time, they thought that this law was for them, that they would benefit from this law on rehabilitation because they were afraid to become victims. So I would tell the government, protect and observe human rights. It applies to you too, because one day or sooner or later, it will apply to you. It will concern you. You know, somehow they always believe that there are people and there are them. And they have a different destiny from regular, ordinary people, but as historians we can cite many examples that these things apply to them sometimes even more than to others. This would be the first thing I would tell them. Then the question from Kazakhstan. I have to say, we have to be just also vis-a-vis -vis the governments and the authorities. Perhaps they will appreciate it. In Kazakhstan, I have to say, especially as of late, a lot has been done to work with the collective memory and to rehabilitate the victims of political purges. They have memorials, they have laws, they have a commission set up that deals with these matters. Many people came to visit us from Kazakhstan and in general a lot of work is being done there. So it's not as if we need to send our paratroopers to Kazakhstan from the memorial and do everything on our own. No. The work is well underway. 
I'd rather say we need to think and develop cooperation. And we should try and explain to one another that this is not some local memory. So there would be purges in Russia that we would be dealing with and then Kazakhstan is separate from that. No, we are talking about one collective memory. And now we have a force majeure situation. We don't know how we can continue to work. But if you try and think about working normally, what I'm deeply touched by and what I find very negative is that because there is this stove piping between different countries when it comes to memory, there are large categories of people who have fallen between the cracks. Between the countries, they were repressed in one country, but they now live in another. The archives about this person are kept in one country and this person lives in another country. Well, this is something that we can cooperate on. And in a very serious vein, and lastly, perhaps one of the most difficult questions, how can we connect peace and truth? You're absolutely right, sometimes. The truth, seemingly, but I stress seemingly, um, is detrimental for peace, but I think it's not the case. On the other hand, all of us who deal with the truth, who try to explore the full, inconvenient truth, we have to be prepared to see a situation where somebody does not like this truth sometimes. Even the victims do not like the truth. It can be the case. We have to be ready for that. Especially when we talk about the conflict, we should be ready not only to face the situation where you would be misunderstood and the pressure brought to bear upon you from the government. This is not something I'm afraid of, but the pressure and um, refusal to accept on the part of your friends, on the part of the victims, this is hard. But if you want to tell the truth, you have to be ready for that and you have to try and talk to people. Thank you so much. And I will allow one last round of questions. We already had the gentleman in the green shirt and the gentleman with the blue jacket, both in the front. And uh, the lady over there. Hello, thank you very much for coming here. My name is Nikolai. I come from the United States. What would you say in response to the criticism levels by some Ukrainians against the Nobel Committee where they awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to citizens of Russia, Belarus and Ukraine? Today's Ukraine. It goes back to the old myth about the three brotherly peoples. What would you respond to that? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Mohammed Yasin from Sudan. I was a rapporteur for a negotiation peace for Juba peace agreement in Sudan. Then I was uh, former, I was uh, first under secretary for federal governance in Sudan up to October when uh, the military retook again the, the, the power. We were very happy that uh, after a long period of uh, dictatorship in Sudan, we managed to remove the regime. But uh, immediately, one year after, uh, everything collapsed and, and the hope of the people for sustainable peace uh, started started to 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 fit. Uh, in your opinion, why there is a huge silence on certain uh, areas in in the continent in Africa uh, on the existing wars and genocides, and what could be done from uh, peace uh, uh, Nobel uh, Nobel Peace Laureate in order to read. Uh, redraw the attention to these wars where there is a huge silence. Thank you. Hello, this is Lily. I'm from Iran. And everything that you were talking about was like reviewing my memories because 
Russia and Iran's uh, government governors, they are following the same path and they're both the biggest dictators. And I would like to know what is your input about current situation of Iran and uh, how do you think uh, we can be more taken into consideration for other countries and how other countries should react, how Switzerland should react, how United Nations should react to, to, to stop this uh, bloodshed every day and detaining and torturing and raping and all the bad news that you can just imagine. Uh, I, I really appreciate your, your lecture, it was amazing. I, I was about to cry and, and I, I would like to know what's your input. Thank you. Well, first of all, about this myth about the three brotherly peoples, I think that this is bad, very bad, when we try to mix together the notion of a human being and the notion of a people. This is what this myth about the three brotherly people is all about. And this is important, this is the symbol, this is the sign, a signal sent by the Nobel Committee. They're saying, basically, you should to separate the people from... Um, the nation, from the government, from the authorities, and they stress that the people who have a clearly formulated goals and objectives, who are try, trying to be responsible for what they're doing, is not the same thing as the government, as a nation, and that people are all different in Ukraine, in Belarus, and in Russia. And I hope, well, I'm not trying to say that we think the same way. Naturally, all of us have our own perspectives and the things that we are focused on, but I'm sure that we now have a chance, a possibility to find a common denominator, and this is what the Nobel Committee told us, and I'm very thankful for that. The second thing, you were talking about Sudan. Why is there a wall of silence? And the third question about Iran was about the same thing. It's the question that boils down to the following. How can we, the people who stand for peace, each of us have our own sorrows, our own concerns? How can we find space in our hearts for this and that? How can we prioritize? How can we say that these victims are closer to me and more important to me than those victims? They're farther away, perhaps I've never been there, so it's not as important. So, how can we do it? How can we make sure that we find enough room for all that in our hearts? How can we stop prioritizing the victims and saying that these victims are important and those are not? It's, a, it's an important question, and we have been dealing with this question in the memorial for 35 years. It's hard. Today, speaking about the memorial, we said a lot that this is a human rights, historical and educational organization, but our official name has three different areas of our work covered. It is charity, charity, I stress, historical, educational and human rights organization. We deal a lot with victims. And after 35 years of doing this job, um, when I'm asked the question, why are you dealing with us? And not with us. I have personally seen this question and heard this question every single day. Why is it that you're dealing with the history and not just the victims? Or why are you dealing just with the human rights and not the history? The people who hurt badly, who need help today, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow. For them, this is a burning question. And on the one hand, we need to understand it. And we need to try somehow to find a way to raise their awareness, not to obscure some victims with others, one war with another. It is hard, but I see that overall, 
мир старается, и знаете, я этот вопрос мне не был задан, но я хочу ответить в конце на незаданный вопрос. Можно? Мне часто, просто его часто задают, а что, собственно говоря, а чем мы можем вам помочь? How can we да? help you? И я хочу еще раз, еще раз сказать, я уже like этого говорила. Again and again and reiterate. Одна из самых таких, знаете, как -то даже понятных uh, аргументов пропаганды, причем еще советская, а потом и российская, она такая, uh, это какой-то аргумент. Пропаганда. Что такое Запад? Запад — это капитализм. Запад — это все продается и все покупается. У Запада нет ценностей. Запад — это просто вопрос цены. Но заплатим больше и купим. Понимаете, вот такая, такая идея, она как-то очень легко входит в голову. Она очень... И тогда очень легко говорить, ну вот вы бедные, там, допустим, в России, в России или где-то, в Иране, но зато у вас принципы, зато вы так с принципами, вы бедные, но они просто богатые и без принципов. Так вот я хочу сказать, что если меня спрашивают, чем мы можем помочь, это вот как раз тем, что я вижу сейчас, защищать ценности, показывать, быть готовым жертвовать ради ценности, показывать, что не все продается и не все покупается. И вот это и есть настоящая серьезная помощь. Все остальное к этому просто прилагается. И это помощь не только России, не только людям в России. Это помощь людям в Иране, в Судане, в Белоруссии, в Украине. Ну, солидарность, готовность на солидарность. And thank you, thank you very much to all of you, my friends. We do feel your support. We do feel your solidarity. Thank you all, our dear friends. Thank you, Lena. Thank you for your powerful message. Thank you for sharing your experience and your indefatigable spirit with us. And. On behalf of all of us, all the best to Memorial, to the other Nobel Peace Laureates, and to all your colleagues who are now working across different European countries and keeping up your important work. A big thank you to the Canton and Ville de Genève and the Fondation pour Genève for the support for this event. And thank you to the Kofi Annan Foundation and the Graduate Institute <laughs> and the Geneva Peacebuilding Platform for bringing us all together here. This concludes the second Kofi Annan Peace Address. Thank you very much.